Let's make music together. Let's make sweet harmony. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, the 80s. A time of gorgeous animation, wonderful storytelling, great characters, and life lessons that will stick with us forever. It seemed as if Don Bluth and Gary Goldman were just at the top of the world in this time period. They were working with some of the biggest names in Hollywood like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Their movies were receiving massive critical acclaim. And in the Land Before Times case, it even beat Disney at the box office. Don and Gary had actually dethroned the kings of animation. It was starting to look like this duo could do no wrong, that their movies were truly issuing in a new era of animation, that nothing at all could possibly go wrong! And then all does go to heaven happened and things started going downhill from there. OOPS! So just like with Secret of Nim, I actually didn't watch this one growing up either. I checked it out many years later as I had gotten older, and people were telling me that it was really good. So I finally sat down, watched it all the way, and thought it was perfectly fine. I didn't hate it, but I didn't fall in love with it the same way I did Land for Time either. But that was a couple of years ago, so now that I'm reviewing all the Don Bluth films, I realize that I'm gonna have to watch it again, and I did, and nothing's changed. It's exactly how I remember it. It has its moments, but overall it's a tonal clusterfuck with terrible songs, plot points that get very little focus, and a do ex machina that didn't even need to be there. Look, I know that sounds kind of harsh, but I'm sorry. This one has its problems, and they're quite significant. It's not as bad as some of their later movies, but you can tell this is where Don Bluth and Gary Goldman were really starting to lose their magic. Or maybe in reality, that magic actually belonged to Steven and George, and the secret of Nim was just an honest-to-God fluke. <gasps> did he just say, I, he did? That's not to say these two aren't genuinely talented dudes. They are. It's just that over the years, I've come to realize a very serious truth about them. They're just people. They're not untouchable gods, and the next nine years would showcase that they themselves can make mistakes. Whether they were taken advantage of by their producers into making shit, or were just genuinely misguided into believing their batshit stories were actually going to be good, we'll never really know, but it's pretty clear looking over their library that they have a certain style to them. Their mission in their movies was to bring animation back to the glory days. In the 70s after Walt Disney's passing, the studio began to buckle under its own weight. They started using cheaper tactics that caused the animation to look repetitive, and their movies just weren't doing as well critically or as financially as they used to. In a weird way, Don and Gary actually succeeded in their mission, as while their movies were making money, Disney was actually failing. The Lamp of Time actually beat out Oliver and Company in the box office, and The Black Cauldron just a few years beforehand was a massive failure for the studio. Seeing Don and Gary surpass them in every way, Disney decided to take the advice that Don himself gave them back when he worked at the studio and returned to their roots, beginning the Disney Renaissance, which as we all know was massively successful at reviving the studio and people's interest in Disney. In a weird way, you can actually say that Don and Gary were the ones responsible for the Disney Renaissance in the first place, even if it was by accident. But it would be through Disney's return to power that would leave Don and Gary with very little. And it all began to fall with this one. After the lamp for time, Steven asked Don if he'd like to still work together, but regrettably, Don would refuse, stating that he wasn't happy with all of the changes that Steven would force on Don and Gary in the lamp for time. Don and Gary wanted full control over their movies, which would prove to be their downfall. Rather than make compromises that could overall benefit the movie, he wanted to just do whatever he wished, which isn't the best thing for any filmmaker, no matter how talented they themselves are, to do. Movies are a team project, and sometimes you need somebody to step in and say, hey, this doesn't work, we need to change it. Don would later admit that he regrets leaving Steven, as he would always make sure Don's movies would have had good scripts. But hey, woulda, shoulda, coulda, right? So the movie is about a dog by the name of Charlie Barkin. Yeah, okay. Who just escaped from the pound. Can we talk about that pound for a quick second? Like, when Charlie escapes with help from his friend Itchy, they try to fucking shoot him! Like, Jesus Christ, how badly do they want to kill this dog? We hear later that he's on death row, but Jesus, why does a dog pound have so many weapons? <laughs> well, we are in the South, so... 
Uh, yeah, you know what? I think I just answered my own question. So Charlie is the owner of a casino for dogs and has a business partner by the name of Carface. You can tell this movie really likes its puns. Allow me to destroy your gallery. Oh. Bullshit. Bullshit. Anyway, Carface wants all of the money for himself and was the reason why Charlie was sent to the pound for some undisclosed reason. Yeah, we never learned why Charlie was put in the pound to begin with. I wonder what they think he did. Well, he does kidnap a little girl in the movie later, so... Ah, that's a weird joke. I don't want to think about that. Anyway, Carface decides to get rid of Charlie once and for all, and he actually ends up succeeding in the end. Like, holy shit! Can't keep a good dog down! So Charlie ends up going to heaven, despite being an asshole his whole life. All dogs go to heaven because unlike people, dogs are naturally good and loyal and kind. Huh. Even Hitler's dogs are up here. There's no such thing as bad dogs, only bad owners. But Charlie, wanting revenge on Carface and just not wanting to die, grabs a watch that represents his life and resets it. It's funny how he's just able to do that, by the way. Annabelle literally says that there's no surprises in heaven, and they know everything that's gonna happen before it happens. You mean there's no surprises or anything? Oh, no, no, no. We know everything. No, it's just lovely. Huh. Then how come you didn't know Charlie was gonna try and trick you? And don't pretend you knew he was always gonna change, okay? You wouldn't let him turn back the clock on his own. So Charlie goes back to Earth and is now somewhat immortal. As long as the watch keeps ticking, he can't die. So returning to Itchy, he plans on getting his revenge on Carface and hears about a monster in his basement that Itchy heard about. They go to find it and discover it's a little girl named Anna Marie. Anna Marie has this strange ability to talk to animals and is able to figure out when animals and races are going to win since they're rigged from the beginning, making Carface rich. Charlie takes Anna Marie so he can use her, he gets rich but then he bonds with her and becomes a good boy and yeah, you can see exactly where this movie's going. Now on paper, this actually sounds really solid. Charlie is a bad dog who cares only about money and living the high life. Initially, he doesn't save Anna Marie out of the goodness of his heart. He actually plans to exploit her for his own means the same way Carface did. But this helps make them bonding over time and Charlie truly learning to care about her feel all the more satisfying in the end. I like how Anna Marie isn't just some whiny brat or super cutesy like something out of Illumination. She actually stands up to Charlie when he's being a dick and even tries to leave him at some point. What are you doing? I'm leaving. You said, said we, we were gonna help the poor me, didn't you promised to find me parents. You didn't even look. Despite this though, she does still feel like a real kid in every way, from being overly sweet to being naive enough for someone to take advantage of her. But with that being said, she's still not an idiot. She can read between the lines sometimes, which I think really helps her stand out from other kid characters in animation. A lot of the charm of Anna Marie really comes from the performance of the late Judith Barzi, who was just so incredibly talented for her young age. Dawn would later state that her acting ability was absolutely astonishing. She understood verbal direction, even in the most sophisticated situations, and that he planned on casting her for future movies. Now, bringing her up, I'm betting you guys want me to talk about what happened to her specifically. But if I can be perfectly honest, if you guys are wanting me to talk about her, then chances are you already know what happened to her. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then feel free to look it up yourselves, but honestly, it has very little to do with the movie itself. Her death didn't really change the movie in any significant way, save for the song that plays in the ending which was written in her honor. I'm sorry if that sounds mean, but it's true. I mean, what else is there to say other than what's already known by you guys? There is this really cool video by a YouTuber named Eleanor Neal who goes really in depth about Judah's career, family life, and the actual tragedy itself. It's a really fascinating video and I'll leave a link to it in the description below if you want to see it. You really should. Anyway, back to it. This is a good case of having an unlikable character as the main character and it actually working out since the point of his character arc is to become a good boy. In the first half of the movie, you see him constantly treat his best friend Itchy like total shit, constantly berating him, ignoring him when he complains. Now to be fair though, Itchy can be kind of annoying in the first half, so it's not totally unwarranted, but as the movie goes on, you really start to feel bad for Itchy. All he really wants to do is lay low and have himself and Charlie go somewhere new where they won't have to worry about Carface anymore. That's it, boss. We could share a nice little place in the Himalayas. I hate the Himalayas. Wait a minute, they got gambling, they got races. So what? Well, they even got a town called Tibet. You know, Tibet. <laughs> Shit, that's good. Looking over all of the Don Blue films, there's one thing that just about all of them have in common, save for this one. The comic relief characters are the worst in them all. Not all of them are bad automatically, but they're usually the weakest characters in the film. 
Jeremy from The Secret of Nim still frustrates me to no end. Giacomo from Thumbelina could easily just fly Thumbelina home whenever he wanted to, but no! Let's just have him flamboyantly sing songs about believing yourself, because that'll help Thumbelina get home, you fucking dickhead! Even Petrie from my favorite Don Blue film, The Land Before Time, falls into this category. His random moments of weird humor just honestly cut through the tone of the film like a knife, and it's just not that funny. Not to mention he's just not as compelling as the other kids. There's a reason why him learning how to fly in the end is just super sudden and he gets little to no fanfare of it. Now, again, not all of them are bad. Tiger from An American Tale is pretty likable, but like with PG, I feel like he's just there to make the kids laugh. And frankly, the comedy in these movies are just never really that funny. Look back on any Don Blue film. Can you think of any particular moment in any of his movies that made you bust a gut? That made you shit yourself with laughter? Because frankly, I can't. I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily, as Don's strength really was in the serious tone and storytelling. His movies weren't meant to be funny. They were meant to tell strong stories with compelling themes and life lessons. If anything, the comic relief characters were probably just an afterthought. Something that was recommended because the movies were too serious, and so the movies could have some levity for the kids to watch, which I understand, but yeah, good comedy was never really Don's strength. That's why I feel like Itchy is sort of an exception in this case. For me though, Itchy is probably the best comic relief character of any Don Blue film, since he's probably the most grounded of them all, and actually has a bit of depth to him that all the others don't really have. There's this really tender moment before the last act where Itchy gets attacked by Carface, and he just unloads all of his frustrations on Charlie for not only spending too much time with Anna Marie, but abandoning him as well, especially when a dangerous gang leader wants them both dead! Charlie is a dick, and Itchy has every right to call him out on this. Dom DeLuise, who's pretty much the Alan Tudyk of Don Blue films, really sells his vocal performance, and this is probably his best performance of his career, at least animation-wise. You completely understand where Itchy's coming from. He didn't want revenge, he was just happy his friend was okay. But that wasn't enough for Charlie, no! Charlie had to steal Anna Marie. Charlie had to construct his own casino with his fucking name on it! No wonder why Carface was able to learn that Charlie was still alive, even though the whole point was to lie low in the first place. You thought I was dead? So will Carface. But the rat killed me. But try to kill me. You know, he's what? got something up his sleeve. Yeah, a gun. And when I find out what it is, I'm gonna ruin him. <laughs> Carface ain't gonna look for it here. He thinks I'm dead. Remember? <laughs> Oops! Yeah, it's a real stupid fucking thing to do, Charlie. This is where the cracks in the movie start to show. Despite Charlie's plan being to get revenge on Carface, Carface himself kind of disappears for a little while and doesn't really have much bearing on the plot for a good chunk of it. We don't even see him learn about Charlie being alive, he just knows about it the next time we see it. Again, it's obvious how Carface learned about Charlie being alive, since, you know, Charlie's an idiot, but at least the movie could have given us a scene where Killer sees the bar and reports to him or something, but no! Carface just knows about it and figured it out off screen because that's always fun. Show don't tell, right? The movie really loses focus in the second act as it completely forgets about Charlie wanting revenge on Carface and instead has him go do his own thing with his own casino. This wouldn't have been that big of a deal if they didn't explicitly say that Charlie won their revenge against Carface. But where's the revenge? I don't see any revenging happening anywhere. Carface is barely even here. What, what's going on? It isn't even until near the hour mark that Carface finally tries to kill Charlie with a ray gun. Like, okay guys, we get it. This is a stupid baby movie for babies and you can't possibly show an actual gun in a movie with drinking, gambling, murder, and literal demons from hell in it. I'm sure nobody noticed this really awkward lip sync, which looks like Carface said the words, a machine gun and set up a gun. Yeah, very smooth, guys. As smooth as Dolores' bit and we don't talk about Bruno. Nice! Speaking of the music, the songs in this movie are honestly pretty damn bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but these songs are shit. Not a single song I genuinely liked or thought was necessary to the film. Everybody says the first song, Can't Keep a Good Dog Down, is pretty good. I guess those people like show tunes? I don't. I think it's very forgettable. The lyrics don't really further the plot or explore Charlie's character all that much. Like, we know he's a bad dog. He just broke out of the pound! There's also this bit in the song. Even <laughs> a bit of Siam. No! C can you like not? Okay, you've had like 20 years to learn from the Aristocats, okay? Wise up! 
Then there's that song in heaven called Let Me Be Surprised, which is admittedly better, but it feels like I'm listening to three different songs all at once. None of the sections sound like they have anything to do with each other, and it sounds like the song itself is confused. There's also this other major issue that I know is gonna be a very unpopular opinion. Burt Reynolds sounds terrible in this movie. You what? I'm sorry if that rustles some jimmies, but it's true. He's just really bad in this, guys. I know it's weird to say considering he was a good singer. If anything, that just makes this whole thing worse. Like, what the fuck happened here? Burt just sounds so disinterested with everything he's singing. It's like he reads the lyrics to these songs and just went, Dear God, this is something I actually have to sing? But then he remembered it's a paycheck, so, you know, do what you gotta do. Then we get easily the worst song in the whole movie. The song about sharing, of course. This one sucks. This one is so bad. I don't think I can put into words how much I fucking hate this song. If this song was a person, I would strangle it. For starters, it just sounds bad. Secondly, it's fucking useless. How on earth does teaching these snot-nosed brats about sharing affect the plot in any meaningful way? Advance the story? Develop a character? Give us some interesting visuals? Storm the beaches of Normandy? It does nothing! It's worthless! The closest thing it does in any form for the movie is that Anna Marie discovers the wallet that Charlie stole earlier and lied about. But come the fuck on! You could have had that shit happen in a million other ways! The word forced doesn't begin to describe that shit. And finally, Look back on this movie, look back on the gambling, the drinking, the murder, the possible child abuse, and then come back to this Sesame Street bullshit. It's so out of place. Not to mention only a couple minutes later, do we get that dream sequence where Charlie's in hell? Which by the way is a great scene. Just so fucking sick with the visuals, man. Imagine the whiplash I got from watching this, going from High Five to Dante's Inferno in the span of like three minutes. It's just so jarring, like seriously, how did that even make it into the final cut? Like, did they really need this song? Were the producers behind this movie like, guys, 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 look, this movie's got murder and hell and shit, it's just way too dark for kids, okay? We need to lighten things up for them, and I got just the thing. Sharing. Make it happen, guys. Seriously, fuck this song. Stupid fucking worthless childish nonsense. Then we get Anna Marie's song, Soon You'll Come Home, which is easily the best song in the movie, but even then, it's pretty derivative. I just kept getting mad somewhere out there vibes from this one, only with way weaker visuals to back it up. On top of that, it's pretty hilarious how the singer for this song sounds nothing like Judith Barzi at all. I understand why Judith couldn't sing it. I get it, but still, it's a little awkward listening to it. And finally we have Let's make music together Let's make sweet harmony <laughs> Yes, we've come to it This part of the movie The most disjointed, out of fucking left field scene in this entire film Now, god, what did they call this guy again? I remember for the longest time, this guy had a name that we all used to make fun of him he became sort of a meme in the reviewer community, and everyone used him as a reference when talking about something that was really random. Oh, but I can't remember what they called him. Man, what did they call this alligator with big lips? God, what number is that? I don't remember. Oh, I remember now! King Gator. That's his name. Y yeah, that that's a name, all right. You seriously couldn't call him King Al? You know, sh short for alligator, you know? <laughs> Since you love puns so much movie, King Al is just too stupid? Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. This whole entire sequence is stupid. Absolutely zero connection to anything else in the movie. Not to mention it's an absolute acid trip in the worst way. There's also like no build up to King Gator at all throughout the movie. Not a single mention of a monster gator just looming around in the sewers. Like I get we're in New Orleans and gators are a thing there, but this still is just so out of nowhere. The only reason this gator exists is so that he can come and save Charlie and Anna Marie in the end when Carface captures them both. But even then, Itchy was rounding up all the dogs from around town. Why couldn't they be the ones to save Charlie and Anna Marie? Itchy gathers all the dogs, but then they don't do anything. What was even the point of that? Back to the song, it's just weird. I especially hate the parts where he sings underwater. It becomes virtually incomprehensible at that point. And those rats that serve him? <laughs> Guys, c come on. First the Siamese, and now this. This movie aged poorly the day it was released in theaters. Speaking of which, does anyone else think it's kind of weird that King Gator and Charlie can understand each other? Like, really, think about that for a second. 
This movie makes a big deal about how animals can't understand each other if they're a different species. Carface can't understand mice, but Anna Marie can. Charlie can't understand horses, but Anna Marie can. The rats that serve King Gator are, and I say this with as much respect as I can, savages! So even Anna Marie can't speak to them. But Charlie can understand gators, apparently. What?! Yeah, suddenly the rules of this world start to feel really inconsistent and make no sense. How does the gator talk to the savages, but Charlie can't? Can other dogs talk to the gator? Shouldn't the gator be a savage with his own language? How does Anna Marie even talk to animals in the first place? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. It's never explained how on earth Anna Marie can talk to animals. I'm sorry, but this is weird even for this movie. Apparently it's a rare, one-of-a-kind thing, and yet it's never explained how she's able to do this. Like, are there other people out there like her that can talk to animals? Can she only do this because she's a kid? Will she lose this power as she gets older? This movie gave a little girl a literal superpower and never explains how she got it in the first place. I know this is probably one of those things that might not really need an explanation, kind of like the miracle from Encanto, but considering how everything in this movie is still pretty grounded, you know, for what the movie is, I think a girl that can just talk to animals needs an explanation. Like, why not try and do what the second movie does, where Charlie being an angel is enough? It's simple and easy to understand, plus it's actually established how David can understand the main characters. Of course, then again, that movie would go on to break its own rules, but we'll get to that one later down the line. Oh, <laughs> trust me, we will. The movie feels like it had a bunch of ideas that no one could fully decide on what worked and what didn't. They all sound like they could in their own right, but together the way it is just makes the whole film feel disjointed, inconsistent, and confusing. This causes the big finale to feel really forced, since there really wasn't much interaction between Carface and Charlie throughout the film. This is because, again, the movie couldn't really focus on their dynamic. This could have been a really cool opportunity to make Carface more than just some generic crime boss who wants money. You could have really dove into his and Charlie's relationship. Maybe make it so where it was Charlie who screwed him over first, making his transition to a good boy later in the movie all the more powerful. But no, just have Carface be a bland, money-hungry asshole who yells a lot. Yeah, that's compelling. I will admit, though, I do like how the movie ends. I think Charlie saving Anna Marie, dying, and staying dead is a great idea. It really showcases just how strong their relationship had become over the course of the movie, along with Charlie's development. Along with that, there's also that extra gut punch that was the fact that this was Judith Barzi's final film. It really does feel like we were all saying goodbye to her in the end. I normally don't have a problem with studios bringing back characters whose voice actors have died since they are just a character after all, but I am glad they never brought back Anna Marie in any future films. Given how they handled the goodbye scene, it really just wouldn't have felt right using her again in the future. Look, I know a lot of people like this movie, and I can see why people would like it. It has good scenes here and there that really do show me this movie's potential. The first 30 minutes are super solid, and outside of the songs, I was really invested in it. But the moment they go to the horse races and forget all about Carface, it all just kind of goes downhill from there. Even the animation in this film is pretty lacking when you compare it to Don's previous work. While still good animation, it has a few issues here and there, like how the set locations aren't really that memorable, save for Hell and King Gator's Lair. Although that last one is mainly because of how weird it is, so it's kind of hard to forget that one anyway. Overall, All Dogs Go to Heaven is far from heavenly. It's not beyond redemption, but it definitely needs confession. This is a movie that honestly doesn't know what it wants to do, so it ends up trying everything. The songs are honestly terrible, and it took at least 13 listens through the Encanto soundtrack to get my mind back in shape. What this movie really needed to do in the end was just figure out which story it wanted to tell and focus on that one specific one, or at least find a way to combine the two stories in a way where both get the right amount of focus. Also get rid of that sharing bullshit and everything involving King Gator and that racist shit. Absolutely useless and doesn't need to be there. Speaking of which, this movie also needs to pick a tone. I'm willing to give that a bit of a pass though, since I know like The Land Before Time, this movie was subjected to a lot of censorship as well. Not to the same extent, but you can clearly tell in some scenes. Maybe some of that childish bullshit like the sharing song was added in because producers thought the movie was too dark. Some of the scenes in the movie feel awkward, like that scene where Charlie does get hit by the car. You can tell they animated him getting hit by the car, but it suddenly just cuts really quickly to right after the car flies off the dock. The hell sequence especially was cut down for obvious reasons. Like, I don't know, some of this is just speculation, but it's happened with Dom before, so I wouldn't be surprised if it happened here again. 
In the end, I can't really decide if I liked this movie or hated it. It's an utter mess that has moments that shine through the rough parts that I do think make this worth at least one viewing, but I don't think I'll ever want to watch it again, honestly. It just wasn't for me. It's just too unfocused and inconsistent for my liking. And believe me, I do feel bad saying that. I get why people like this movie, and it's not like it's offensively bad or anything, so if people out there still like this movie, that's great! I just couldn't find the light with this one, and apparently neither could Don and Gary because from here on out, their movies would never be the same. I don't think it's as bad as stuff like Thumbelina or Troll in Central Park, but this is definitely where Don Blue's fall from grace began. Over time, he would become more and more desperate for money so he could make his own movies, continuously close down his studios and then open them up again, be forced to bow to the whims of producers who didn't know what the fuck they were doing. It really is one of animation's most tragic stories, how someone with genuine talent and passion just kept getting fucked for years on end during this time period. But those movies are videos for another day. But hey, at least we got these sequels to watch now. Let's just hope that it's at least a little better than this one. Wow. Lord, give me strength. Days passes by